Good evening. My name is Grant Gosselin, and I serve as Director of Undergraduate Admission here at Boston College. And on behalf of our staff, uh, we are very excited to welcome you to this program to learn more about the Early Decision Program at Boston College, and also to learn about the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. I plan to spend the first few port moments of our presentation walking through the Early Decision Plan at Boston College, talking a little bit about some of the nuances and data from this most recent class. And then as I introduce the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program, we've invited a panel of four Gabelli Presidential Scholars to join the conversation and to share with you their experiences at Boston College thus far, and to talk more in depth about the various elements of the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. I'm gonna share my screen with you and uh, help walk you through some of the things that we feel would be important for you to know uh, about applying early to, to early decision to Boston College. So I thought we might start just with a basic vocabulary lesson in terms of understanding early decision. There are many different early admission programs uh, throughout the country uh, and each of them may vary uh, slightly, but early decision is one of the original programs. Boston College offered early decision uh, before 1982, uh, but then since then had offered an early action plan for uh, the better portion of 40 years or so. Uh, and most recently, two years ago, uh, reinstituted early decision in place of early action. Early decision is a program for students that have really done their research. They've visited colleges either virtually or remotely to the extent possible. Uh, they've learned about various programs at the schools on their list. Perhaps they've talked to students or engaged with students in programs just like this uh, and have really identified a clear cut top choice university. It allows students to then identify themselves uh, as a student in that pool that has done that homework. Um, this process is about making a match and it allows students to raise their hand and be identified in a, a rather crowded applicant pool otherwise. Students sign an agreement alongside their parent or guardian uh, and their school counselor that notes that they have applied to this institution as an early decision applicant, that they're only submitting one early decision application, and that if admitted, they pledge to enroll at that university. They also agree to withdraw any other remaining applications that might be outstanding at other universities. Because if they're committing to a Boston College in this case, uh, you don't want to move forward with an application and jeopardize uh, someone else's admission at that other institution, someone else that really wants that spot. So it's important that students adhere to that uh, in colleges uh, and universities uh, could jeopardize a student's admission if they don't follow through with that agreement. Uh, obviously, students can only apply to one early decision institution. Uh, if you're making that sort of a commitment, you can't be in two places at the same time. So clearly, you can only make one early decision application. Now, the one caveat to that is that schools like Boston College uh, offer two different early decision rounds. We offer early decision one, which carries a November 1st deadline, and early decision two, which carries a January 1st deadline. They are the same admission plan. All the same tenants that I've just walked through are relevant at both rounds, but they do provide students with a different deadline. Now, there are really two reasons why a student might choose to apply early decision two instead of early decision one. Early decision one clearly is for students that know on November 1st that they have a top choice institution. Students that apply early decision two could potentially not have a decision about a first choice institution in November, but after a couple more months of research by January 1st, may in fact have their first choice college identified at that time. So that allows them, again, a little bit more time to make that decision. Other students might have two institutions that are really at the top of their list. They might apply to one of them. They have to make a choice on which one they're applying early decision, and if they are not successful in that admission application, it almost gives them a second opportunity then to readjust their lists, um, reshape their plans, and then focus on their institution that was their next choice. So it does allow students really to have two opportunities uh, to make a commitment to the institutions at the top of their list. I should have noted at the very beginning 
of this presentation that there is a question and answer chat uh, uh, opportunity if you do have a question relative to early decision or the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. We are asking that you limit questions tonight only to these two topics. Um, we have a whole series of events throughout the course of the fall that will address questions in other areas. So now that I've defined early decision for you, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits of early decision. And let me start with explaining a little bit about why colleges even have early decision programs. The first and, and foremost uh, rationale is that we are looking for students who are really the best fit for Boston College. I, we talk a lot about this process being a match process, right? You as students right now are completing your investigation of the colleges on your list. You might be visiting campuses in person if the campuses are open as Boston College is right now for visits on campus. You might be continuing your research online you're looking to identify the list of schools that's worthy of your application in a matter of weeks. Once you apply, we're looking to identify the students that we believe are the right fit for Boston College, those students that understand our mission, that understand the pedagogy of the curriculum, and really are looking for uh, uh, this institution as uh, a place that they uh, are really excited to enroll. And so when students apply early decision, they're identifying themselves as, as really having done half the work of making that match. And so it allows us uh, to know with greater certainty that these students are going to be a good fit for the institution. Quite honestly, uh, there is a security uh, me mechanism uh, involved in this uh, decision to uh, have early decision at the institution. And it really allows colleges and universities to begin to secure a foundation for each incoming class. Uh, COVID-19 is a great example there. Uh, not only did it displace uh, the students that were uh, enrolled in high schools and, and add chaos and confusion to your lives, it did the same for colleges. And as we go into a regular decision round, having a section of the class already identified um, really is a good start for colleges and allows them to have more security moving in to the regular decision round. And then, as I mentioned before, it really allows us to begin to build a community of students who from the very first day they arrive understand the mission and values of the institution and are excited to jump in with both feet to every opportunity that presents themselves. Oftentimes when students head off to college, it, it takes a few weeks or months for students to really understand the institution. Uh, and that delays their ability to get involved in clubs and activities, their ability to get involved really in uh, the full college experience early decision students, again, have applied to their top choice college. And so that level of enthusiasm and excitement is there from the moment they arrive on campus. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits for you as the applicant. Um, and as I mentioned before, it allows you to identify yourself in a very crowded applicant pool as someone who believes you're really the right match for Boston College. In a moment, I'll talk a little bit about the size of our applicant pool at Boston College last year. Uh, and one of the advantages to early decision is that you'll be part of a much smaller applicant pool, about one tenth the size of the overall pool. And so it really can, uh, again, allow a student to uh, be uh, uh, noticed a little bit more clearly as a student that has done their homework up front. What we heard a lot as we talked with students about the college process is that many of you are exhausted by the college process. Uh, many of you have been going through this search for a year or more, and many students really want to be done with this process before the end of their senior year. The traditional admission timeline concludes in May of your senior year, and that's a long time for students who submit their applications, their regular decision applications in January to wait before they have learned of the college's decisions and made their final decision on where they'll go to college. Early decision students, those specifically that apply early decision one, will learn of our decision in early December, allowing them to secure their spot in the class and then enjoy the rest of their senior year. And lastly, uh, quite frank, frankly, it does increase students' chances of admission to your top choice college. So let me walk through a little bit of data from this last admission cycle. 
At Boston College this past year, we received just under 40,000 applications for admission. And as you see here, if you combine early decision one and early decision two, we received about 3,200 early decision applications versus 36,000 regular decision applications. So less than one tenth the size at the early decision round. For all the reasons I've already mentioned, colleges are really looking to identify uh, a foundation for their class and a foundation of students that are both academically qualified and eagerly awaiting uh, enrollment at that institution. And so Boston College last year took a pretty aggressive stance with our admit rate. Uh, almost 39% when those early decision one and two rounds are blended uh, of students were admitted to Boston College through the early decision plan. And 48% of our class enrolled through early decision this past year. And so it again has achieved that goal for Boston College and for almost half of our students, uh, they have enrolled at Boston College uh, as their top choice institution. During the regular decision round, as you see, over 36,000 students applied. It is a much larger pool. Uh, and there are many qualified students in that pool uh, that uh, we won't have room to admit. Uh, and it's very difficult for Boston College. We're not a school that tracks demonstration of interest and does not use demonstration of interest in making decisions during the regular decision round. And so it can be very difficult for a student to stand out in that pool. And every year we know that we admit students during the early decision round who have goals and aspirations to attend other institutions. And we know that every year during regular decision, we are unable to admit students that might very well have chosen Boston College if given the opportunity. So again, regular decision does create a little more uncertainty, both for students and for the colleges. And so early decision, again, can uh, bring a little more of that uh, assurance to both sides of the equation. Let's talk a little bit about financial aid, because one of the biggest criticisms of early decision programs is that they tend to benefit families that, that don't have to worry about costs, right? If you can sign an agreement heading into the application cycle that if admitted, you will enroll, you and your family need to be very confident that the cost of attendance is within reach. And colleges and universities uh, really want you to do your homework, not just in terms of finding the right fit, but also in terms of a financial match. And so let me talk a little bit about the reasons why we believe a program, an early decision program at Boston College is a good program. Uh, we are one of just 20 private universities in the United States that are both need blind in the admission process, meaning we don't know anything about your family's financial background when we make our admission decisions. We're admitting students based on their merit within the context of our applicant pool. And then once we admit students, we guarantee to meet 100% of demonstrated financial need, uh, regardless of when that student applies. Now, there are two caveats to this, uh, that uh, students do need to be either a US citizen or a US permanent resident to be eligible for need-based financial aid. And so we want also families to realize that when they're going through the process. But again, Boston College has one of the most generous admission uh, and sorry, one of the most generous financial aid policies in the country. Uh, over $160 million was awarded in need-based financial aid last year. Uh, and so we really feel quite good about having an early decision program, knowing that students, regardless of whether they apply early decision or regular decision, are not only going to have the same package, regardless of round, but will have truly one of the best packages available. We encourage students that might be concerned about the cost of attendance, perhaps that's the only reason a student would not apply early decision, to use our net price calculators. And I've given you the web link right here where you can go online and enter some basic financial information, uh, generally from your tax returns. It's a rather in-depth form. It might take you 20 or 30 minutes as a family to complete, but it will produce a range of where your financial aid is likely to fall if you qualify after being admitted with about a 90% confidence level. So it's a very good tool for families uh, to use in determining whether or not they believe Boston College is within reach. Now, because Boston College is so generous with need-based financial aid, we have just one merit-based program at Boston College, and that is our Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program, which I will certainly talk about in just a moment. 
But before I do, let me talk a little bit about the various deadlines associated with our admission plans. As I may have mentioned earlier, those students looking to apply early decision one to Boston College, those students that have clearly identified Boston College as their top choice institution should consider applying early decision during the uh, early decision one round, and that carries a November 1st deadline. Those students can expect a decision from us by the middle of December. And those uh, oftentimes we're able to get those decisions out a little bit earlier than that. Last year, I think we got decisions out on uh, around December 5th. So again, we do try to turn those decisions around as quickly as possible so that you may uh, move forward with other options should it not work out. Early decision two and regular decision both carry a January 1st deadline. Early decision two applicants can expect the decision in about the same amount of time as early decision one, and that is by February 15th. Again, last year, we were able to get those decisions out by the first week of February. And then those students that apply by January 1st, because that applicant pool is so large, we do, do take the better part of the winter months to make those decisions, and we commit to submitting a decision to students by April 1st. I was looking in the chat room a little bit and uh, there were a few questions about, particularly about SAT averages and Boston College is in a test optional uh, admission plan year this year as we were last year. Uh, it's difficult to know what those trends will be this coming year because the SAT and the ACT is more readily available than it was during the, the real heart of the shutdown during COVID-19. But last year, 42% of applicants that applied to Boston College overall uh, submitted test scores. About 60% of the students that were admitted to Boston College had submitted test scores. And that might seem to some like a, a large leap uh, between the amount that submitted and the amount that, that were admitted, but there are correlations between uh, high testing and high performance in the classroom. So for us, that actually wasn't uh, too big of a variance. We felt pretty good about that decision. Uh, in that, that uh, percentages. And then of the enrolled class, exactly 50% of the students who enrolled had submitted scores and 50% of those who had not submitted scores. So I do see, uh, again, a few questions out there, uh, typically around SAT averages and the uh, optional plan this year. And uh, I can tell you a little bit more about the middle 50% range for our enrolled class this year earn between a 1430 and a 1510 on the SAT and between a 33 and a 34 on the ACT. So a much tighter range for the ACT, but again, those are the middle 50% ranges. I do also see some questions about admit rates by individual school. Uh, and Boston College actually does not uh, uh, submit, uh, not uh, an announce, I guess, admit rates by school because they do vary from year to year. I can tell you that uh, this past year, the most selective school was the, the Connell School of Nursing. We saw a 60% increase in applications to the School of Nursing this year, uh, largely due to COVID. Uh, many students felt called to enter that field and, and serve others. Uh, and so that became uh, our most selective school simply due to environmental factors beyond our control. Um, that was very different the previous year when the Carroll School of Management was the more uh, competitive school of the four. So it can vary from year to year, um, but generally within about four to five percentage points between each of the four schools. Uh, and so we encourage students, again, not to worry too much about individual uh, statistics uh, on admit rates. Uh, I, we really encourage students to provide, uh, apply to the school that is the best fit for them. I do see a question uh, about uh, whether interviews are offered and unfortunately interviews are not part of the admission process at Boston College. Most uh, highly selected schools uh, have very large applicant pools like Boston College does. And there's an equity issue when we begin to interview some candidates and not all. Um, we disbanded our interview program back in the late 1990s. Uh, and instead uh, we're looking very carefully at uh, the written portions of the application um, which do allow students to uh, have a voice in that college process. Let me uh, shift to a couple of other topics because I wanna make sure that families are able to uh, hear from our students tonight. 
Um, one last question I see here is that student, someone has asked if a student has applied to one college and that it might be more selective and they're not admitted, would they then be considered for another of our colleges? And the answer is no. Uh, we do have those four colleges, the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, the Carroll School of Management, the Lynch School of Education and Human Development, and the Connell School of Nursing. And we do ask students to apply directly to those schools. We do have strict enrollment targets for each of those schools. And so uh, we do try to keep things very clear uh, for students uh, that they know that they're applying to that school only. I think it's also a very fair program specifically regarding early decision because there are schools that you might apply to under an early decision program and they may admit you to the college but not to the program you're looking for. And that puts you in a very difficult position because you've committed to attend but you're also not able to pursue the academic and professional path that you may have in mind. And so we feel our program is much more transparent and certainly allows you to have uh, clarity around where you'll be heading and to ensure that you're studying the things that, that you're most interesting for you. The last thing I'll point out on this slide is our priority scholarship deadline. I'm gonna talk in a moment about the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. And to be eligible for this program, the only thing that students need to do is submit their applications to Boston College by November 1st. You can be an early decision one, an early decision two, or a regular decision candidate to be eligible for the Gabelli program. Uh, but you simply have to make sure that you meet the priority scholarship deadline of November 1st. We will then evaluate those applications ahead of time. Last year of the roughly 40,000 students that applied, about 12,000 students chose to submit their application earlier. And all of those students were reviewed uh, in the months of November and December. And then we selected a smaller group of candidates to interview for the scholarship. Uh, after that date. So let me tell you a little bit more about the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program and then uh, turn the, the floor over to our panel of experts, our current students who will be happy to talk about their experiences. To begin, let's talk a little bit about the program benefits. Um, the, the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program includes more than just a, a scholarship, um, but that is the primary benefit that uh, many students are thinking about when they are choosing to submit their applications by the priority scholarship deadline. It's a full a four year tuition scholarship uh, for 18 students that enroll in each class. Uh, it is not a need based scholarship, it is a merit based scholarship. And so uh, if students have additional financial need beyond full tuition, uh, if they do need additional resources to cover their room and board or their books or other expenses, uh, they could then receive uh, additional funding uh, through need-based financial aid. The program also includes fully, funders, fully funded summer experiences. And these are really the primary uh, differentiator of this program from many others uh, that, that are limited only to scholarship money. It includes international travel where students would immerse themselves in language and culture in a country of their choosing. It includes service learning, particularly around a social justice issue that the cohort of presidential scholars um, would identify uh, and really commit themselves toward working uh, toward uh, some solutions in that summer. It includes uh, professional internships. We'll use our vast uh, alumni base of 180,000 alumni all of our resources in the Career Center to identify internships that align perfectly with the goals of each individual scholar. And then there is incredible additional academic support. Every student at Boston College will have great mentoring and advising, but presidential scholars uh, have an additional layer. They are all assigned an individual faculty mentor advisor. They work uh, potentially on personalized research, either with that advisor or others throughout campus that might be focused on areas that they might be interested in. They also are receive additional mentoring and preparation for advanced level fellowships. Many of our presidential scholars through the years have gone on uh, to win Fulbright awards or uh, other high level awards like the Marshall, the Truman, the, the uh, other internationally recognized fellowships after graduation. And the program is really keen on ensuring that students are in the very best position possible to be eligible for those programs. I've mentioned again, as a reminder, November 1st being the priority scholarship deadline. 
and we would very much encourage you to uh, meet that deadline uh, for full consideration. And if you'd like to learn more about the program, uh, you can do so at the email, uh, excuse me, the web link at the bottom of the page here. So at this time, um, let me tell you a little bit about um, the application process. Uh, after you submit your application by November 1st, there's really nothing else you need to do. Uh, there's no separate application. We don't require you to submit additional essays. Uh, your application to Boston College is your application to the Gabelli program. And as I mentioned, after we I review those candidates in committee throughout the months of November and December, we will identify about 55 to 60 finalists that we will notify shortly after the new year and then invite them to interview for the scholarship program. The interview will be a virtual interview uh, series over the course of a week. You'll have the opportunity to engage at various points in the week with members of our community, faculty members, members of our staff, current students, an opportunity to meet the other scholars uh, and get, begin to share relationships uh, with those students. So it really allows you to learn about Boston College while we're also learning about you and the things that you would contribute to the program. And then we'll identify students uh, in typically in March, uh, whether they've been selected as a Gabelli scholar. Uh, and then we will invite those students to come to campus at our expense in April. Um, regardless of where you live, um, we'll pay your travel expenses and your accommodations to be on campus. And that will really allow many students that may not have already made their decision uh, to kick the tires, to attend classes, to really see Boston College uh, one last time before, or perhaps the first time before they make their final decision. At this point, I am pleased to turn the floor over to my colleague, Susan Migliarisi, who uh, is not only an associate director on the admission staff, but our liaison to the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. Uh, and Sue has been just such a, a steady uh, force in the program for uh, over 20 years. And so I'll let her uh, introduce our panelists. I'd like to thank you at this point for tuning in to learn about early decision. Uh, I guarantee the best part of the program is still to come. So uh, thank you again for uh, tuning in. And Sue, I'll invite you to uh, introduce our panelists at this time. Great. Thank you, Grant. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this portion of our um, webinar. Uh, I am thrilled that I've been able to work with the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program uh, since actually uh, over 20 years. Um, and I have the absolute joy to work with our students and get to know them from when they're applying in high school through our selection process um, throughout their four years and after um, with BC. So I'd love for our panelists to um, come on right now. Great. Thank you, guys. Awesome, good to see you. Um, I was saying to them earlier that I, it is interesting to see them back on Zoom because I've been so lucky to see them in person lately, which is fantastic. Um, but I wanted to just have the students introduce themselves first. Um, just name where they're from, their major and what year they're graduating. And we'll start off with Robert. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Robert. I am a senior studying political science and Russian um, and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Hey y'all, I'm Izzy. I'm a junior majoring in international studies, minoring in global public health and the common good, um, originally from Arkansas. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Kenny Dow, I'm from Randolph, Massachusetts. And I'm majoring in economics and minoring in finance. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sancha Sahadev. I'm a freshman and I intend to major on bi in biology on the pre-med track and I'm from New Delhi, India. Thanks, you guys. Um, so we're going to get started and do a bit of kind of a Q&A. And I actually was monitoring the actual uh, virtual Q&A just now. So I know a lot of you have questions about applying for the Gabelli Scholarship, what we look for in an applicant. And we certainly will address all of that. But I did all, all really want to start out and have you get to know the students a little bit better and hear about their experiences and how um, the Gabelli program has shaped their time at BC or starting to shape their time at BC in 
Sanchez case. Um, so I'm going to just ask the students a few questions to begin with, and then we'll move to the Q&A and make sure that we get your questions answered as well. Um, so I'm going to start with Robert, since he is the senior, um, and to ask him a little bit about kind of his four-year experience here at BC, particularly through the Gabelli, and talk a bit about kind of the academic characteristics um, that he's experienced through the Gabelli program in connection with his overall academic life at BC. What's, what's that been like? Um, how have you been able to connect with faculty members, research, those types of things? And how has all of that shaped possibly where you may be headed in a few short months after you graduate? Yeah, definitely very relevant. Um, so I, I guess the hallmark of the GPSP is rigorous academics, which may sound daunting, but in my experience, that really just means that the program wants to help you take full advantage of your time in college. Um, what that means is that other students in the program and in particular, the directors of the program want you to succeed and will go out of their way to help you succeed, whether that's in applying for scholarships, grants, fellowships, applying to graduate programs, landing internships, uh, you name it, they're interested in helping you achieve it, which really allows you to hit the ground running. Even as a freshman, you'll come to campus with a built-in support network. Uh, you'll be more aware of the resources and opportunities available to you. As a student, you'll feel more comfortable approaching upperclassmen, more comfortable talking to professors and administrators about any research that they're doing, any labs that they're running, classes that they're teaching. Um, you really have a foot in the door from the outset, which is conducive to you know, eventually landing that research gig or that internship with a faculty member or with someone outside of Boston College. Um, and it also really allows you to get to know professors from the get-go. Uh, and I feel very fortunate to know not only the directors of the program on a personal level, but also you know, other teachers that I've connected with through the GPSP over the years. Um, and I, I'm happy to give a particular example of that because I am applying to law school and that's largely thanks to the six-week service learning program, which Grant mentioned, uh, which you complete between your, your freshman and sophomore years. And it was during that time that I was fortunate enough to attend a seminar hosted by one of the BC law professors, Professor Sharon Beckman, who not coincidentally uh, runs the BC Law School's Innocence Program. She gave a really fantastic presentation, led a really awesome discussion, and by the end of it, I was totally floored and totally convinced that I wanted to work for this program. Uh, and so I approached her after the, the lecture and you know, got to talking with her. She asked for my resume, and within the, the semester, I was working with the BC Innocence Program. And I'm now, I guess, two and a half, almost three years into it. Uh, it's been incredible. I've really gotten to know Professor Beckman. And I guess what stands out to me about that experience is that, you know, A, I wouldn't have known about the BC Innocence Program if it weren't for the GPSB. B, I wouldn't have gotten face time with the, the person who runs the program. And then C, you know, even if I had somehow gotten face time with this person outside of the GPSP, uh, there's no guaranteeing that I would have gotten the internship. I think that the GPSP really helps you uh, have a leg up in terms of applying for these sorts of things and landing these sorts of opportunities. So, you know, that's that's my experience with it and very fortunate in that regard. Thanks, Robert. I'm going to move on to Izzy. Um, and one of the hallmarks of the Gabelli program, and, and it really connects to the Jesuit mission of Boston College, is global engagement, that we are not just living here in the United States, we're in a global community. And we try, um, again, pre-pandemic times, we offer a lot of study opportunities through the Gabelli program. Uh, in the first year, the students go to Europe. In the second year, um, they go to Latin America. In the third year, usually to the Middle East through the program. It's all fully funded. It's fantastic. Um, and I know COVID upended a lot of that. And as you probably weren't able to do all the things that we normally do. So in that context, talk to me a little bit about global engagement. Um, how was that part of your experience, even in the middle of COVID? And how has that kind of affected your thought process about who you are and kind of your purpose? Yeah, so unfortunately, those amazing trips that were just mentioned, I have yet to go on one of them. Um, our Italy trip was canceled the week of freshman year, and it turned out to be um, the correct move. 
Um, but yeah, so unfortunately with the pandemic, uh, international travel has obviously, um, and rightfully so, been restricted. Um, but the global engagement has still been there. Obviously, I'm an international studies major, um, so that's something that I've also made the forefront of my own personal studies. Um, but within the program, uh, our former director, um, Father Jim Keenan, is now the Vice President for Global Engagement of Boston College, and so we have a great connection there. And then also you can tell that it's at the fore of the GPSP program. Um, this past year, we had a visiting scholar from the Middle East come and give a presentation on his personal art collection that was on display in the McMullen Institute. Um, and so it's weaved into our programming and it's also just an overarching theme that also applies to what we typically do after our sophomore year, which is an international uh, summer language immersion experience. And I can go ahead and talk about what I was able to do um, this past year, even in the midst of the pandemic. So the great thing about this summer experience is that as a scholar, you're given total control over what you decide to do. The only requirement is that it is some sort of language immersion for ideally eight weeks um, in a foreign country. And when I began planning this, uh, I realized quite early on that international travel was not likely to be approved for funding. Um, so I shifted gears knowing that I wanted to do something with Spanish and really thought about how I could get some sort of Spanish immersion while staying close to the United States. Um, and was inspired by what was going on at the US-Mexico border and realized that that was a space that I could not only get Spanish immersion, but also um, live out those Jesuit values of being a woman for others. And so through the program and various connections, I was able to get connected with Kino Border Initiative in Nogales, Mexico. And I spent the summer there volunteering, uh, working every day in their uh, what they called the comedor, which was a building where we served food and gave clothing to migrants um, as they arrived at the border. And it was a great experience not only to get the Spanish immersion, but also to get a service experience and really have um, something so different while still being so close to the United States. It's an amaz amazing experience, especially in the midst of everything that's been going on. Um, and a great segue to my question for Kenny, uh, because one of the fabulous things about the program is how much living in community experience you get to have as a group. Um, and one of the things that the students do after their first year is that they do live in community and think about social justice and service in a really deep way by doing service in the city of Boston for six weeks. Um, and then we want that to continue. And the sophomores have a social justice project um, that they present to the campus wide, to so the entire university. So Kenny, if you talk a little bit about this past summer, um, what that's been like, or what you all decided to do for your social justice project and kind of how this summer experience kind of shaped your summer. Yeah, definitely. So this past summer, unfortunately, because of COVID, we couldn't live on campus with each other. Um, so, but we did have virtual service placements. Um, so I was, one of my placements was called Missing Them, which is a New York based project. And their goal is basically to commemorate people who have passed away because of COVID-19. So my role was interviewing families, learning about family members, you know, who passed away of COVID and then drafting their obituaries and eventually publishing them. So, um, and this, these are for families, you know, who couldn't, um, you know, have someone draft up an obituary. That's when we would step in and offer to help them. Um, so that was one of my um, placements. That one was virtual. My second placement was with um, the, Brookline High, the Brookline High School. Um, and I was a tutor for students coming back from mental health leave. Um, so basically students returning back to the classroom, I would help them out with math, um, English, different projects they um, had to do, just basically catch them up um, with school. So definitely two, very two distinct experiences, um, definitely a meaningful summer. And that's, um, usually that would be in person again, but um, you know, because of COVID, um, it was virtual, one was virtual. I was lucky enough to get in person with my tutoring. Um, just because I live in close to Boston, um, others were mostly virtual. Um, and then as, um, as you said, that rolls over to sophomore year. So this year, our social justice 
issue that we're focusing on are undocumented immigrants and really shedding light on you know the struggles of immigrants within Boston and Massachusetts. Um, so we're kind of narrowing that focus um, down to just Boston and Massachusetts. Um, and you know the pro big project that we have planned for the spring, um, we're still working on some of that. Um, but you know basically we're trying to involve the arts along with it and um, the story of the immigrants painting that through you know, interviews, different pictures, um, all within Boston. So we're trying to put that together as a cohort. And you work hand in hand with people in your grade. So, you know, every week I'm having check-ins with people um, in my cohort, you know, trying to plan the project, logistics, um, content interviews, et cetera, et cetera, and video production. Um, so you really do get to build a community with your class and, you know, the greater BC community. That's excellent, thank you. Um, and now for Sancha, who just arrived to VC, but certainly went through the selection process and there were tons of questions in the Q&A a bit about that. So can you talk a little bit about kind of why you decided to apply to BC? Um, did you apply regular decision by the priority scholarship deadline of November 1st? Um, or did you apply ED, like what was your process? And you know, why particularly did Gabelli kind of stand out for you? Hmm. So I actually applied to regular decision, uh, but by the priority scholarship deadline. And um, I think by the end of high school, I had sort of like, I understood what I was looking for in, in a college. And I think two things that were really important to me was being in an intellectually stimulating environment, but also having like a really strong and supportive community around me. And I think the Presidential Scholars Program does an amazing job of combining both those aspects. Um, I think particularly one thing, uh, one other thing that also stood out to me about the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program was the emphasis on, you know, service and global awareness and social justice. And I think um, Izzy, Robert and Kenny all touched upon that just now. Um, so well, realistically, I never actually considered the possibility of me actually being a part of the program till I was called back for the selection process, but I decided this seems great. Um, this seems pretty ideal. This aligns with what I'm looking for. So I just decided to take a shot and apply by the priority scholarship deadline. And last year, as will be this year, we did do a virtual kind of interview process for Gabelli, which is a little bit different than what Robert, Izzy, and Kenny went through. Um, they were live and in person. Um, but we did find that doing a virtual selection process where the interviews and we do some mock seminars and we have a lot of group conversations um, and you hear from the, the director of the program, Kathy Bailey, we thought it actually worked quite well um, because it allowed students, especially students um, from further distances like international students or kids from Hawaii or what have you, um, to be able to log on and utilize the selection process um, without having to kind of upend their regular high school lives. So we thought it worked well enough that we're gonna do it again this year, but I just wanna ask Sancha a little bit because it was different than what everybody else did. Kind of how did that go for you? It was a little weird to be on Zoom and do all of this? Or, or how did that experience go? Well, I was actually really glad that it was happening because it gave me as an international student the opportunity to be a part of the selection process. Um, and well, I was pretty surprised to like get the scholarship, like the finalist notification. So I was super excited. And then we got an email, I think, detailing everything that will be happening. I think we had two interviews, um, one group discussion, one mock seminar. And I was just like a little intimidated because it seems so extensive. And, but then when I got there, I, re I re that was not the case at all. I think everybody was super warm and super welcoming. Everybody really, really, really seemed to love the program and they were willing to talk about it so much. I think, um, so we, as, um, I don't know if this was done every year, but um, when we had the selection process virtually, we would each appointed like a scholar as a host. And I was able to Zoom with mine before um, the selection process began. And she was so in insightful. I think I had Julia and she, she was the same. She she's also pursuing bio 
bio like I intend to do. And she was so warm and, you know, she gave me so much insight about what the program is about. And um, even during the selection process, um, while things were going on, I think I loved how everyone had so many diverse interests and so many perspectives to bring to the table. And I remember saying to my mom after like the selection process ended, uh, I was like, if I get in, this is definitely where I'm going. No questions asked. Which we always love to hear uh, because it's certainly a fun process for us because through the selection process, we get to see who you are more than just what's on paper. So just to kind of step back a little bit, because I know there were tons of questions in Q&A about kind of how we make the Gabelli decisions and what was so special about these guys when we reviewed their applications. Um, so everybody who applies by November 1st, no matter what round you are, ED1, ED2, or regular decision is automatically considered for Gabelli. So each of us in the admission office is reviewing applications that have been submitted by November 1, looking for possible Gabelli candidates. And it's, you know, it'd be so nice to just say, oh, this is this, 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 and this is what I'm looking for. Um, it unfortunately isn't as easy as checkoffs as that. I mean, First of all, we certainly want to see that academic rigor um, coming from each of the students, and we did absolutely see it with all of you um, in terms of quality of program and, you know, top half percent of the national applicant pool in terms of the rigor of what you're doing in high school. But it isn't just that. Um, we are Basically, I always say, as I'm reading an application that is a possible Gabelli student, I'm getting super, super excited. And all I want to do is sit down and talk to this student because they are fascinating in some sort of passion that they have somewhere along the way. And there's nothing specific that it has to be. Um, you know, for some of the students, it may be an interest in social justice. For others, it may be something with sustainability that they care about. For others, it may be an amazing writer or singer or dancer. It's just something that stands out for that student that you cannot manufacture. It is just part of who you are um, that hits us and says, oh, we really want to bring them to our committee and talk about them and think, are, is, would this be a good person who can enliven this GPSP community um, and really add to it in a way that is unique and different? Um, so that's, it, it, I know that sounds like super vague, but it's truly what we do when we do all of this. Um, and so then we get to the selection process that happens in February and we start to get to know the students beyond just what the pages are telling us. And through these interviews that we have with them, they do do too. Um, and then also through this mock seminar, class experience, because we know you're all smart, um, but we want to see it in action. And then also through this group conversation, because again, so much of their experiences are being in community with each other at, at in the Gabelli, but also at BC. Um, so to kind of segue to that, I'd love for each of you to talk about um, just briefly some sort of either academic or extracurricular involvement that you have that has nothing to do with the GPSB that you just kind of do um, that has nothing to do with that particular program. And whoever wants to jump in first, go ahead. I'm happy to take this. Um, so I'm involved in a program called BC Bigs. It's an affiliate of Big Brothers Big Sisters, for those who know what that is, a mentorship program. Um, and I'm entering my fourth year of a match with a young boy from the Dorchester area of Massachusetts. His name is Noah. Um, it's been a super rewarding experience. Every other Saturday, he comes to campus. Um, we spend the day together. And it's, it's been a really meaningful way to, to find a community of other big brothers, big sisters on campus, but at the same time to, you know, branch out and experience the, the larger community that Boston has to offer. I can go next. Um, so I'm involved with a club on campus called Student Health Equity Forum, um, and it's a public health advocacy club. Um, and we have educational meetings and project groups that work with um, both local and national public health uh, nonprofits to aid them in their initiatives. Um, and it's been a great way for me to both um, unify my academic interest um, while also finding a larger community on campus that shares them with me and is able to have some really in-depth um, 
and conversations that are approached with great care um, and interest. And then I also will say this is partially due to the program, um, but in the program as a freshman, everyone takes a class called Perspectives, which is a dual philosophy theology credit class. Um, and you will be with other presidential scholars, but you'll also be with other um, BC students. And I found that there was a really great community of meshing between scholars that knew each other before the class started and meeting new people that we didn't know because of that class. Um, so that was also a great way to kind of merge the two communities. One thing I'm involved with is um, a club called the First Generation Investors. Um, so what we do is we uh, teach students about the stock market and different equity markets, um, uh, mostly high school freshmen to sophomores um, from the inner cities um, where they don't get that course, you know, that financial course within their public school curriculum. Um, so we teach them about that. And then at the end of every lesson, they have, get $20 to invest and they can choose, you know, whatever they want to invest in um, based on the lesson or, you know, based on their own research. We just talk to them, um, you know, about what's happening in the financial markets. Um, I've definitely been able to build, you know, a real connection with my fellow tutors and students and whatnot. So that's one thing that I'm super grateful I joined. Um, well, so I just got here, um, but uh, back in school, I was involved with um, piano and uh, sustainability. And I've noticed that BC pretty much has a student organization for and everything. So I just um, joined the piano ensemble and eco pledge, which, which is an environmental organization on campus. And it's I just think it's a great way to meet new people, people with similar interests, but at the same time, who have so many different perspectives. And I love being a part of them so far, yes. Awesome, I was gonna ask you how it was going so far. <laughs> so good, I'm glad all is well. Um, I'm gonna throw this to Robert because as a senior, he's the only one who got to do everything. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, the uh, study trips that you guys were able to do? Um, I have some great videos that Gabby did of all of you, so. Oh, I, I have yet to see those. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I, I probably should have put them up on this so that everybody could see you guys and talk a little bit about um, when you all live together in Greycliff too over the summer. Okay. All right. I'll start with the, the study trips. Um, so there are three that you take in the summers in between your school years. Uh, the first is to Italy, uh, to a different city. I think it's Rome, Florence or Venice usually. The second is to Costa Rica. And the third is to somewhere in the Middle East. In the past, it has been either um, Kuwait or Jordan. Um, and the purpose of these trips is in part to expose you to a different culture and to get you, you know, curious and learning about the world around you and the world outside of the United States. But I'd say, especially with the two later trips with um, Costa Rica and Jordan, the point is also to interact with uh, activists and educators and people who are doing uh, really important on the ground work within their communities in those different countries. Um, and so it is, it is as much an educational trip as it is, you know, a, a trip that's designed to build community among your cohort of scholars um, and a, a fun trip as well, because they're all very exciting. Uh, in addition to that, there is the, the six week service learning experience where you do live in a dormitory. In the past, it's been a dorm called Greycliff with your fellow scholars. Uh, you all have different placements throughout the city of Boston. You go in the morning and work at your various placements in the city. You come home uh, usually in the mid afternoon or the evening, and you spend the evenings together, whether that's uh, reading books in preparation for your Friday morning classes or, you know, cooking dinner together and just enjoying each other's company, uh, getting out into Boston and exploring because that's a really great opportunity to do that as well. But it's sort of uncanny how close you become as a group. And I've, I've realized, you know, as I, I get farther and farther from that moment, what uh, a sea change that ushered in among our cohort and how we're, you know, we're lifelong friends, largely because of that experience. And that's really exciting. So. And you have to cook for each other, which I always find amusing and cook for us sometimes. Sometimes we get invited over in the summers and get fun meals too, which is always a good time. Um, we are coming up on the last few minutes. So I want to make sure I can take, I'm going to take a couple questions that are short here. I'm um, Izzy, what's the name of the program that you were talking about? Somebody just asked. Um, it's a club called Student Health Equity Forum. Great, thank you for that. And then do um, the Gabelli scholars take a course together every semester? 
No, it's just a freshman year, the perspectives course, which is a year long course. But then after that, um, there's no more required classes together. But what do you guys do together all the time, though? Can you talk a little bit about Tuesdays? Yeah, so we have our Tuesday night meetings, which are a four year. Um, I, you could guess you could call them a requirement, but I don't think any of us really see them as such. Um, I usually enjoy going to all of them. Um, in fact, we just had one tonight, actually, that was targeted towards my class about um, planning your internship summer. And so Robert and a couple other seniors were there um, to talk about what they did and share some advice. So some good um, interclass um, networking and bonding. Um, but yeah, the Tuesday night meetings are a staple of the GPSP program. Uh, sometimes they look like the one tonight where it's targeted towards a specific class. Um, so I participated one last week about planning your language summer. And then other times it will be a professor on campus presenting about their work. Um, there are fun ones also. The freshmen got to go to an escape room a couple weeks ago. Um, each class usually gets to do a cultural event, so like going to a show in the city. Um, but yeah, if anybody else wants to hop on here and talk about their favorite Tuesday night memories. That's a good, that's a good one. Like what, for Kenny, well, Sanja's only been to a couple. So for Kenny and Robert, do you have any like favorite ones that you've had so far? I love trivia night. That was something that was new last year because we went virtual and they were trying to find some ways to make it fun but uh I get a real kick out of it I think it's pretty funny so and we're going to utilize trivia night as part of the, not part of the actual selection process <laughs> like you're not going to get any points because you're really good at trivia but we use it for fun anything that you've liked so far Kenny yeah one of my favorite um nights last year although it was virtual was when Mario Gabelli came he's one of the donors of the program and, um he came and spoke with us. Just an interesting, interesting character. So um, definitely had some good pieces of advice, some interesting stories uh, to tell us. So I always look forward to whenever he's on campus. Yeah, for sure. And he was just on campus the other day when we had, we just had our family weekend at BC. We had a nice reception for all the Gabelli scholars and their families and Mario Gabelli um, came and spoke for a bit too. So that's been fantastic. Um, one quick last question, then I'm going to throw something out to all of you. Um, do Gabelli scholars get to choose their classes first? Nope. <laughs> but you all survive, right? And get what you want. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, so I want to ask each of you to just briefly, because uh, we've got about three minutes left, to offer some words of advice to everybody out there. I mean, Sancha's the closest to remembering what it was like to be in high school, but it's not that far from you all. Just a piece of advice about going through this process. I mean, Gabelli is one thing, um, but it's just applying to college in general can be certainly anxiety producing. So if you could give any of the students some piece of advice Go for it. Whoever wants to go first, and we'll, we'll make sure everybody gets a chance. I'm happy to dive in again. My mom always had a really reassuring message about college applications, which is where you go is not who you'll be. Um, you know, college applications are a difficult and uncertain time, but, you know, it does not dictate your future. You're going to do incredible things no matter where you wind up. So I hope you can take comfort in that message. That said, uh, when you are looking at colleges, you do want to pick a place that will help you discover who you are and what your purpose is. And I, I do think BC does that exceptionally well. So, Yeah, to build off of that, um, the best piece of advice I got was that it's not where you go, it's what you do with it. Um, so really taking into account like what Robert said. And then also, I think especially with programs like Gabelli and applying to a lot of um, elite institutions, don't feel like an imposter. Um, you are more than qualified, I'm sure, to be applying to whatever school you're applying to. Um, so be proud of yourself and be confident in what you've done. I think the best piece of advice I've gotten is just to slow down and reflect on it. You know, it's the Jesuit way at BC, just slow down, reflect. Um, definitely think a lot about, you know, yourself, your strengths, weaknesses, um, and whatnot, and really where you see yourself. Um, obviously, that could change over the next four years, but right now you're in the present. So you know, reflect on, you know, the experiences you've had and go with that. Um, I would say just, yeah, to um, build off of Kenny, 
uh, reflect um, a little bit on what is important to you because every college has a different campus culture and that is going to be important super important in determining how well you fit in there um, uh, and don't be afraid to take risks um, if you feel like oh um, I may not be qualified for this just go ahead and take your shot anyway because you never know that's awesome advice, you guys. I always love doing panels with our students, um, especially the ones that I've known since their applications in high school. So thank you so much for everything. And thank you all of you for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of everyone in the admission office and everyone through the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Office, we wish you a wonderful night ahead and a great year ahead. And please feel free to reach out with any questions. Good night, everybody. Thank you.